Hello, my name is Tom Buley, and today we are talking about the COVID quarantine project that I worked on together with Ricardo Gornstein. With this project, we are introducing berets, which are little carrier boards designed to rapidly accelerate the development of low cost, capable, and powerful robotic systems leveraging modern single board computers. I read somewhere online this nice quote that white space is where unmet and unarticulated needs are uncovered to create innovation opportunities. I believe our new little berets indeed address a significant white space in the rapidly growing field of robotics, and I hope by the end of this talk you're as excited about their impending availability as we are. To summarize this project in just a couple of slides, here is a recent version of the Raspberry Pi, which has an install base of about 40 million units. These single board computers and their several clones are remarkably fast and inexpensive and are great for addressing many high level tasks in complex robotics applications. The central challenge, though, is that we are always stuck reinventing the wheel on several mundane low level tasks, such as how to do efficient voltage regulation from LiPo batteries to the standard 12 volts, 5 volts, and 3.3 volts that you need to put a robotic system together, as well as several other sub problems, such as incorporating H bridges to drive brushed DC motors and stepper motors, setting up brushless motor drivers, the tuning of which is a bit more delicate, generating PWMs to communicate with servos and ESCs, counting clicks from encoders in order to monitor shaft rotations, communicating with other sensors and actuators using I2C, SBI, and UART, integrating an IMU, magnetometer, barometer, and GPS for situational awareness, etc. Dealing with all of this extraneous stuff from scratch every time you have to develop a new robotic system can delay project completion, both on the educational and in the product development settings, often resulting in opportunities lost. Our answer to this conundrum is to build the ultimate hat for the Raspberry Pi, which we call the Raspberry Beret. This little carrier board has most of the typical functionality that you need for small robotic systems built right in, and additionally has a little shield-like expansion area already wired up, so anything that we didn't specifically include in the beret that you might also need, you can easily and securely add on yourself. Here's a map of some of the key functionality included in the Raspberry Beret. Seven dedicated quadrature encoder counters for monitoring shaft rotations, two flexible H-bridge systems capable of driving several motors and steppers, all of the voltage regulation circuitry needed to support two cell to six cell LiPos, standard three pin signal headers for driving up to 10 servos and ESCs, a little STM32 G4 microcontroller to coordinate everything, CAN and RS45 transceivers and pinouts for communication to a daisy chain of several remote devices in challenging environments, a balance connector and an intuitive state of charge indicator, a USB connector for programming from your laptop, etc. We also wanted to have a substantial degree of platform portability, so if you start a project on one single board computer and later decide that you want to upgrade to say a cell phone grade single board computer, like the one currently available from Qualcomm, this RB5, and others in the 96 board CE format, you easily can. Unlike many developers, we actually aim to be platform agnostic. We therefore set out to provide a standardized low-level interface to the common sensors, actuators, and power sources in typical robotic systems via a family of carrier boards. We are thus also introducing today the Black Beret to support the 96 board CE family, such as the RB5. The Black Beret has essentially the same functionality as the Raspberry Beret, thus allowing you to easily port your high-level Linux code from one class of single board computers to another with minimal changes to the low-level interface to the sensors, actuators, and power sources used, which may be accomplished using berets. In total, the Beret family is being designed initially as a family of six motor control boards that are compact, powerful, efficient, and easily extended. They can operate as either carrier boards to the popular single board Linux computers available today or standalone. Again, their primary functions are to regulate power from 2S to 6S LiPos, so up to 28 volts at up to 20 amps, and for feedback control of several motors of a wide variety of possible sizes. The goal of the project is to simplify and accelerate the development of feedback controls for mechatronic systems. Berets are open design hardware and are coordinated with open source software, which readily facilitates people modifying these hardware and software designs to make their own custom controllers for specific applications. Such applications run the gamut in mobile robotics, industrial automation, drones, precision agriculture, pharmaceutical and vaccine development, food preparation, cleaning, etc. Berets thus provide a platform portable carrier board family that, again, allows you to port your high-level code from one Linux-based single board computer system to another as the algorithmic demands on your system increase, such as revision processing, while keeping the same low-level interface. Berets can also be used in standalone mode, 
eliminating the Linux-based single board computer altogether. Recall that a little STM32G4 microcontroller is included, which is built around an ARM Cortex-M4F with several dedicated hardware subsystems. This MCU is quite capable of coordinating many low-level tasks simultaneously in complex robotic systems. Further, working in standalone mode to debug multi-threaded code that efficiently controls an entire robotic system directly using only a small but mighty ARM Cortex M-class processor running a real-time operating system, helps to prepare a system for high volume production at substantially reduced system cost. The alternative in the product development setting, prototyping new robots using full-featured Linux boards with robust fault-tolerant multi-threading coding techniques, but then working with a different team in a different country speaking a different language to implement your tuned feedback controllers on a low-cost ARM Cortex M-class processor can lead to a fragile single-threaded production code that is essentially impossible to maintain. We've been there and done that. With Braze, we aspire to significantly improve this prototype to production workflow for ourselves and to enable others to do the same. The capabilities of the Bray are, again, primarily focused on power regulation and feedback control. They include well-filtered switching regulators, generating an essentially ripple-free 3.3 volts at up to 3 amps, 5 volts at up to 6 amps, and an adjustable 3.3 to 12 volts at up to 6 amps. Dedicated quadrature encoders for monitoring shaft rotations, several H bridges for driving brushed DC motors and stepper motors, dedicated PWM generators to coordinate servos and ESCs, a full set of attitude sensors, Excels, gyros, barometer, and magnetometer, standardized pinouts for SBI, I2C, and UART for connecting to a wide range of other sensors, CAN FD and full duplex RS45 transceivers for long range communication, and a small analog system with two 12 bit DACs and two 16 bit ADCs with both an electronically adjustable gain and an electronically adjustable cutoff frequency of its second order low pass filters to get the most out of the available dynamic range of its analog subsystem. Also, you can attach little expansion boards called Bray Shields on the Arduino like headers to easily add a variety of extra functionality like brushless DC motor drivers, additional brushed DC motor drivers, analog filters with digitally adjustable poles, zeros, and gain, OLED displays, differential GPS units, additional I2C and UART connectors and buttons, breadboards for quickly testing new circuit designs, etc. There are six variants of Berets currently being developed. I've already introduced the Raspberry Beret, which is a full-featured Raspberry Pi daughter board, sometimes called a hat. We have also a reduced version of this board called the Red Beret that we will make available at low cost. It uses the same PCB, just partially populated, which helps us to save both development cost and production cost. I've also introduced the Black Beret, which fits the Qualcomm RB5 and other boards in the 96 board CE format. We additionally have a version called the White Beret under development to fit to BeagleBone Black or AI. We are also making a small wired standalone version called the Green Beret, which is designed to run as a CAN or RS-45 slave device. On a factory floor, in a pharmaceutical lab, or on a farm, you'll probably want to communicate to such slave devices over an environmentally rugged twisted pair using RS-45. Whereas if you're developing a smart car type application where you're worried about noisy voltage fluctuations and strong ground potential differences, you might want to use CAN. Note that the Green Beret is very small and doesn't even have any H bridges on it. So if you need to drive brushed DC motors with a Green Beret, you'll need to incorporate them using one or more Beret shields. Finally, we are also making a small wireless standalone version for mobile applications called the Blue Beret. This board makes a little extra space by getting rid of the CAN and RS-45 subsystems and rearranging a bit, allowing us to fit in one H bridge subsystem to drive at least a handful of brushed DC motors without requiring a Beret shield. We are thus planning on six distinct boards that have different numbers of motor drivers, encoder counters, and pinouts for servos, ESCs, and wired COM as required for different applications. Four of these boards support CAN and RS-45. Four of them are full size, two for the Raspberry Pi, one for the 96 board CE format like Qualcomm RB5, and one for the BeagleBone Altoids 10 form factor. And two of them are a bit smaller and designed for standalone applications. One is wired to be driven as a slave device over CAN or RS-45, and one is wireless for mobile applications. Just one slide of background on how we got into this project. We played a key role working with Jason Kridner and his team at BeagleBoard.org in developing the BeagleBone Blue. We learned many valuable lessons, perhaps the hard way in that effort, including that surface mount JSTs break off a PCB pretty easily. You really need to use pin through hole JSTs to reliably connect to other components in order for your connectors to survive hundreds or even thousands of mating cycles, which are inevitable in the product development setting. 
single board computers get faster every year as the march of progress in electronics, also known as Moore's law, is relentless. If you want to build a motor control board that stands the test of time, you really need to decouple the single board computer system itself from the board that implements the voltage regulation and the motor control functionality. This is precisely what we were doing with the Bray family of boards. There's a large range of wireless standards, Wi-Fi, LoRa, Sigfox, Bluetooth, Bluetooth Low Energy, Sigby, Z-Wave, Sub 1 Gigahertz, LTEM, and others. And these standards are still evolving quickly. Different applications demand different wireless standards. It is thus essential that the user be allowed to select which wireless standards they want to implement. So wireless connectivity in the setting of a general purpose motor control board like the Berets must really be provided as separate modules on a shield. Thus, if the wireless protocol you need isn't already implemented in the attached motherboard, you can select precisely which standards you want to use, wired up with fast, dedicated SPI or UART connection directly to the MCO. 2S LiPos are insufficient for many applications of interest. 4S or 6S LiPos with substantial current carrying capability provide for a much larger range of interesting applications. The IMU needs to have a dedicated SPI connection to the MCU, which should run a real-time operating system, or RTOS, to provide near real-time feedback. Finally, inexpensive and robust mobile inverted pendulums, or MIPS, in the classroom and remote teaching settings are very effective in getting students started in embedded control. We thus developed a kit called EduMIP a few years back, which was a big hit when it was introduced. We're currently working on its successor, dubbed MyMIP, that will support the entire Beret family of boards and will further enable makers to 3D print shells that easily slide onto the MyMIP frame and attach securely, thus enabling essentially anyone with access to a 3D printer to bring their 3D prints to life. MyMIP is actually going into production quite soon, so stay tuned for that. We'll discuss MyMIP further in a separate video. I'd now like to give a somewhat deeper technical overview of some key features of Berets. For power input, a standard XT30 connector is incorporated, running it up to 15 amps continuous and 20 amps peak, and at up to 28 volts. So Berets are characterized by some pretty serious power carrying capabilities. There's a MOSFET that protects the board, which can both shut the LiPo power off and later turn it back on. There's a switching regulator to provide VS1, which is user selectable somewhere in the range of 3.3 to 12 volts at up to six amps. VS1 is used to drive the servos and ESCs. There's a switching regulator to provide VMB, which on most arrays is five volts at up to six amps to drive the attached motherboards and to drive some of the external peripherals that you might want to hook up. Finally, there's a switching regulator to provide 3.3 volts at up to 3 amps to drive the several ICs on the beret and to drive the rest of the external peripherals that you might want to hook up. The outputs of all three of these switching regulators are well filtered with very little voltage ripple. We also have a power op amp that provides an intermediate voltage, VS2, somewhere between 0 and 3.3 volts. This device can either source or sync up to 400 milliamps and can thus act as a reference ground for the powerful analog subsystem, which operates between 0 and 3.3 volts. This op amp provides voltage right in the middle, which can thus act as the ground signal for the analog subsystem when operating in a bipolar setting. The setup I just described is used on the three berets that have five volt motherboards. The black beret drives a motherboard that requires about 12 volts input to operate and communicates to its connected peripherals at only 1.8 volts. Some extra circuitry is thus needed for this board to do the appropriate voltage shifting so it can communicate with the common sensors and peripherals that you might want to hook up, which today normally require either 3.3 or 5 volts. Note that we use efficient step-down buck converters for voltage regulation, so we need to use at least a 4S LiPo to drive the black beret, which connects to a 12-volt motherboard. Also, a 96-board CE format board itself generates 5 volts from the 12 volts provided to the motherboard, so we simply pass that 5-volt bus back up to the beret over the low-speed header, so the black beret itself doesn't actually generate 5 volts. Note that VN powers the motor drivers directly, VS1 powers the five servos or ASCs that you hook up to signal header B. You can power five more servos or ASCs on signal header A with either VS1 or with VN directly. There's a 12 volt shunt connector which allows you to bring a whole lot of power up to 28 volts at up to 12 amps out on signal header A. VMB powers the attached motherboard through the motherboard header. The 3.3 volt and 5 volt buses power the logic circuits on the Bray, the JSTs, and the digital analog headers. Finally, all of the digital outputs are 3.3 volt TTL and 5 volt tolerant, so we can drive and communicate with peripherals that operate natively at either 3.3 volts or at 5 volts. The stack up that we converge to is central to the Bray's broad functionality. They are eight layer PCBs designed with a very deliberate trade off. Sufficiently thin copper layer thicknesses are needed to facilitate the fine features required to break out a 0.8 millimeter pitch ball grid array, 
while simultaneously sufficiently thick layer thicknesses are needed in other sections of the board to handle high current where necessary. We thus actually use different thicknesses of copper on the eight different layers of the PCB based on each layer's primary functions. In some regions, layers carrying high current are even stitched together. For electromagnetic interference and signal integrity considerations, we put power and ground planes next to each high-speed signal trace. We used curved traces with no sharp corners. We performed careful impedance matching to prevent signal reflections, and we used match trace lengths for high-speed comm and the corresponding clock signals. Also, signal ground is carefully isolated from the noisier power ground. Looking at the overall layout of the board, we can map the board into quadrants. The logic sensor and expansion quadrant is in the northeast. The connector quadrant is split between the northwest and the southeast. The power quadrant is in the southwest, and the motor control quadrant is just north of the power quadrant. To see how power is distributed efficiently, note first that all high current traces are short and fat, and as I mentioned previously, in some cases, even stitched together to carry more current. For example, VN travels north here on multiple layers, and VS1 travels east there, again, on multiple layers. The microcontroller used is a 100-pin version of the STM32G4 with 512 kilobytes of flash. These are its specifications. This microcontroller has several supplemental hardware units, which are very useful in feedback control settings. We use this supplemental functionality on the STM32G4 very thoroughly on the berets, so much so that we actually didn't even have enough extra digital pins on the MCU after we were done wiring all these modules up to use as GPIOs to drive random other simple functions on the board. We thus added a GPIO expander to provide 24 more GPIOs to handle various other flags and simple functions. We also included a seven-channel LED driver for the main LED indicators on the board, in addition to several status LEDs hooked directly to various GPIOs. Note that dedicated hardware subsystems on the MCU drive most of the several subsystems on the beret without loading the main ARM core. To better illustrate this, here's the connectivity chart of the berets. The MCU is in the middle, and all of these green ovals are the various hardware subsystems that surround the ARM Cortex M4 on the STM32G4. So to send out PWMs to drive servos and ESCs, to count the transitions of quadrature encoders to track shaft rotations, or to communicate over SBI, UART, or ITC, etc., all such repetitive tasks are handled by dedicated hardware subsystems on the MCU, leaving the ARM core free to tackle more involved calculations. Primarily, the ARM core needs to be available to take care of situational awareness, fusing together inputs coming from the IMU, the magnetometer, and the barometer, together with additional inputs from the wheel encoders, the GPS unit, etc., in order to estimate the evolving dynamics of your system. Since the other more mundane tasks, including the repeated calculation of many of the FIR and IIR filters using ring buffers, as required to evaluate the feedback itself, are offloaded to dedicated hardware subsystems on the STM32, we have plenty of clock cycles left over to perform the sensor fusion on the ARM core itself. The low-level software library driving this entire system is designed to be compatible with the robot control library developed previously by James Strassen, a former student in our lab. We worked closely with both MathWorks and National Instruments during this previous work with BeagleBoard.org and aim to stay consistent with the containerized environments that we used back then so we can still deploy control codes developed in such advanced graphical programming environments directly to the berets. Of course, we will also have a ROS interface wrapping all of the low-level functions that the Bray can support. The key idea is that by handling all of the low-level feedback needs on the MCUs of the Bray, we free up the attached Linux-based computer for more complex tasks like vision-based mapping and audio processing. Berets are very small boards packed with advanced functionality. Their high-density integration is achieved using a variety of techniques, most notably via in-pad technology. As an example, there is a component that solders to the PCB right here. Instead of putting the solder bed for this component here and then routing a little trace out to via somewhere else on the board, which then takes the signal down to a different layer and routes it to a different component, we instead put the required via directly underneath the solder pad itself. This modern PCB fabrication technique, when used properly, allows you to move components into a much denser arrangement, accomplishing much more in a tiny footprint, which can easily be fit into a small robotic system like a robotic hand. Further, implementing via in pad technology is actually not that expensive at most fab houses as compared to implementing the older technology of blind and buried vias, as illustrated here. Blind and buried vias for HDI are expensive because they require a separate drill step at each layer of the PCB before it is sandwiched together. Berets thus have no blind or buried vias anywhere. Instead, all of the vias on the berets go all the way through the board, which eliminates some expensive steps in the manufacturing process. Berets still achieve a very dense integration of components in the layout, primarily as a result of the effective use of the NPAD technology. In order to detangle traces on this complex eight-layer board, some basic traffic rules are employed. Some layers, like these, are primarily slated for north-south communication. 
where others, like these, were east-west communication. We also removed the unused pads around the vias under the BGA to open up additional space to snake through the traces around the dense array of vias. Here's an example of the length matching that was done on traces corresponding to high-speed signals and their corresponding clock traces, as indicated by the extra squiggles in these three purple lines, which results in the lengths of these three traces matching exactly on each of the three layers that they travel through. The net result of all of this care is faster and more reliable communication between components. The advanced ECAD software program that was used, Altium, makes the design of such complex layouts straightforward. Advanced ICs are implemented on the berets across the board. The data sheet that describes them, which I'll give a link to at the end of this talk, goes a long way towards illustrating the amazing levels of efficiency and advanced functionality that are now possible in a very small footprint for many of the subproblems that must be solved when building up small robotic systems. Particularly impressive are the DRV8912Q1 motor drivers used from Texas Instruments, which deserve special mention here. A pair of these DRVs are implemented. Each of them has 12 half bridges and each generates up to four PWMs. A fast dedicated SPI connection attaches these DRVs to the MCU. The MCU thus simply instructs the DRVs the commanded direction and duty cycle to actuate the motors over SPI and the DRV generates the PWMs necessary to make it happen. This setting facilitates nominally simultaneous independent bidirectional control of eight brushed DC motors. There's quite a bit more that these motors can do, however, as shown on the next slide. Note that the DRVs operate directly at BN, up to 28 volts at up to 6 amps per DRV. This power flows north from the XT30 input in the power MOSFET. Note also that the voltage on BN can drop by over 25% as the connected LiPo battery discharges. This is accounted for in software by monitoring the voltage of the LiPos on the BN bus and scaling the feedback gains of the brushed DC motors accordingly to be inversely proportional to this input voltage. The DRV outputs are wired to JSTZH connectors, which are shrouded for electrical protection and are PTH, that is, they go all the way through the board and they're soldered on the opposite side, so they're very durable. In fact, across the board, all of the connectors illustrated in dark blue are JSTZH. The DRV 8912Q1 can operate in three separate modes. The first is independent mode, in which you just hook up one motor to each pair of outputs from the DRV, so you can actually hook up six motors per DRV, each operating at one amp. Recall that you only have four independent PWMs per DRV though, so at any moment you can independently drive only four motors. Note, however, that you can change which four motors are driven independently, at whatever duty cycle you want, at any moment. The other two motors are called slaves and can operate in full forward, full reverse, full break, or full coast, or they can duplicate the PWM frequency and duty cycle of one of the other four independent motors. This is actually sufficient flexibility in most applications, which usually have some diversity of driving requirements, such as that you don't usually need to drive all six motors independently at the same time. So this setting can often be put to very good use, but wait, there's more. In parallel mode, you can gang together various outputs, leveraging the logical connection options built into the DRV itself. We can select this logic and software to coordinate some outputs to get an identical PWM signal accurately synchronized from a single PWM generator, and then gang these one amp outputs together using external wire harnesses to drive more powerful motors. In the case shown here, we illustrate the driving of one motor at four amps and one motor at two amps. Other ganging configurations are of course also possible. One motor at six amp, two motors at three amps each, three motors at two amps each, etc. But wait, there's more. If the operating voltage is low enough that it is insufficient to drive two motors in series because the operating voltage doesn't overcome the stall torque of two motors in series, then a unique sequential mode is available in which you can select outputs three, six, nine, and 12 as high impedance inputs shown here in red while driving the four motors indicated here in green for a while. Then you can permute which four outputs you set as high impedance inputs and drive the four motors now indicated in the green for a while. Then you can permute again, and drive those four motors for a while, etc. Thus using this mode, you can drive a remarkable 12 motors per DRV or 24 motors total at reduced duty cycles with a single beret, which is pretty amazing. In assembly line sort of configurations, such as robotic machines designed to make hamburgers, where only one cluster of motors needs to be operated at a time, this setting can be used especially effectively.
Arrays are set up by default to drive up to 10 servos or ESCs of a variety of sizes up to three amps each, again, assuming some diversity in driving requirements. These connections are made using signal headers with 0.1 inch male pins, providing signal, power, and ground as a standard. Again, on signal header A, we can select power between VS1 or VN. By default, of course, the beret provides PWM signals to these signal headers for driving standard servos and ESCs. However, there are several alternative hardware supported modes that you can select on the digital pins of the signal headers. You can set up to two additional I2C channels, possibly breaking them out on a brace shield if you have a large number of external I2C devices to hook up, or you can set up a few hardware unidirectional encoder counters on these signal pins if you don't have enough encoders elsewhere on the board, or like all other digital signals broken out on the berets, you can always simply drive the digital signals as GPIOs coordinated by the ARM core itself. Berets are also set up by default with seven quadrature encoder counters, pre-wired on convenient JST connectors that include power and ground, where power is selectable between 3.3 volts and 5 volts. Like the PWM generators driving the signal headers, the counting associated with the encoder connections is performed on dedicated hardware units in the STM32G4, which do the bulk of the repetitive work in the background without loading the main ARM core. Again, there are several alternative hardware supported modes that you can set up on the digital pins and the encoder connectors. You can set up an additional I2C channel. You can set up both a UART channel and a low power UART channel, for instance, to connect up a standard DSM radio receiver. You can set up PWMs to drive 14 additional servos and ESCs, etc. So again, there is remarkable flexibility in how you can configure the several digital channels made available on the various connectors of the beret, depending upon your specific system requirements. There's also an analog header that has two 12-bit DACs, the inputs and output of a spare op-amp ready for the user to wire up, and two 16-bit ADCs. So for example, you can easily hook up a beret to a two-input, two-output analog system and take its full 2x2 two two Bode plot, leveraging the beret's built-in analog subsystem. Additionally, the Bray monitors the individual cell voltages of the LiPo and integrates a intuitive state of charge indicator for the battery. It also monitors and regulates the two adjustable voltages that it generates, VS1 and VS2. Note that we do not regulate LiPo battery charging with the berets. We made a different design decision here than we did on the BeagleBone load. Since we're enabling the use of high power LiPos with the berets, we recommend the use of an external high quality dedicated LiPo battery charger available separately. You need to plug the LiPo into a wall outlet or car battery anyway to recharge, so we figured you might as well also keep the electronics used to coordinate the charging of the LiPo separate from the robot itself and use it whenever you're plugging into an external power source to charge the LiPo. Our analog system has a remarkably flexible Salon Key second order low pass filter with both a software tunable gain and a software tunable cutoff frequency to get the most out of the available dynamic range of its ADC inputs. The components in red are actually included on the STM32G4 itself, and the additional components in black are on the beret. The digital potentiometers shown allow you in software to adjust both the gain of the filter between a factor of one and 4,000 and the cutoff frequency of the filter between 34 and 3400 hertz. For attitude estimation, we have implemented the best-in-class magnetometer, barometer, and IMU available today. Their sensitivities, which are pretty remarkable, are shown here. Note that many such sensors, especially nine-axis IMUs that integrate an IMU with a magnetometer, are not nearly this accurate, so buyer beware. There's also a 32 kilohertz MEMS oscillator that hooks to both the real-time clock of the STM32, as well as the IMU, which significantly improves timing accuracy. By default, these onboard sensors perform fixed rate measurements, sending out a data ready signal every time a fresh measurement is available. This data ready signal can then be used as an interrupt when performing state estimation using a common filter, thus pulling in the measured data the moment it becomes available. Indeed, for convenience, we typically take the clock signal coordinating the discrete time calculations of the common filter to be the data ready signal of the IMU itself. Alternatively, you can set up flags for background monitoring and keep the beret in a low power sleep state in which it is just sipping power off of a coin cell. Then when there's a tap, a shake, a magnetic field spike, or a change in ambient temperature or pressure, or when an offboard sensor detects a change in liquid level, pressure, temperature, pH, etc., you can wake up the beret and the connected motherboard by the power MOSFET and actuate something as necessary, like opening or closing a window, moving a robot arm, advancing a conveyor, conveyor belt, or turning a valve. To quickly review the connectors again, 
The several dark blue connectors are JSTZH, which can drive up to one amps of power per pin, and are used for discrete connections to nearby motors and encoders and various other peripherals, as well as to connect to the CAN and RS-45 transceivers for long distance communication. The key idea here is that if you're using CAN or RS-45, you'd use a short jumper from these little JSTs to ruggedized connectors mounted on the bulkhead of an environmentally protective housing a few centimeters away, and then use a shielded twisted pair to connect from that ruggedized connector to say the barn or the chicken coop a quarter mile away. The 0.1 inch 1.9 Arduino-like shield connectors are used to expand the functionality of the Bray and can drive up to three amps per pin. They include two digital headers, which include SPI and I2C connectivity to the MCU, and an analog header, which handles the ADC and DAC functionality. The two blocks of three by five signal headers are standard connectors for servos and ESCs and can drive up to three amps per pin. And an industry standard JST XH connector is used for monitoring the voltage of each cell of a LiPo battery. A USB micro B input is used for programming the MCU using a laptop computer. And of course, a motherboard header is included for convenience to attach the motherboard. Bray shields are connected on top of these are like header pins. Optionally, shields can also connect to one or to all three rows of signal header A, which can thus provide five extra digital signals from the MCU, in addition to providing a whole lot of power up to 28 volts at up to 12 amps. All of the pins of the one by nine headers, as well as signal header A, are aligned on a standard 0.1 inch grid, so it is easy to attach to them. Shields provide substantially increased optional functionality to the Bray ecosystem. They can be of regular size, which is 1.3 inches by 0.9 inches. They can be a little bit taller, picking up one or all three rows of signal header A, or they can be even larger, covering up a bit of the functionality exposed elsewhere on the Bray in order to provide additional surface area on a Bray shield if you need it. Note that shield connectors are high enough that you can actually sneak wires underneath it to connect to the Bray JSTs. As an example, here is our low current brushless DC motor beret shield. We actually have six connectors on the shield for driving six small brushless DC motors, running it up to 24 volts and up to two amps. Beret shields come in essentially three types. The first, prototyping beret shields, have just an array of pre-drilled holes on a 0.1 inch grid. They can either be non-plated to provide a mechanical backing of commercial off-the-shelf PCBs, or plated for rapid development and testing of your own circuit designs. You can easily populate a prototyping beret shield with a few small components on a standard 0.1 inch grid. We are also making available a beret shield with two custom 128 pin breadboards as shown here to make the problem of quickly testing new circuit designs even easier. The second type of beret shield is prefabricated. Our team is currently designing a variety of dense beret shields with commonly needed functionality, and will develop a GitHub repository where the open hardware designs of these shields will be shared by us, by other vendors, and by individuals in a community-supported effort. We will prefabricate many of these shields as demands dictate. Prefabricated beret shields will thus provide you out of the box with a wealth of additional optional functionality that didn't make it onto the berets themselves. For instance, the first prefabricated beret shield that many people are going to want is one with brushless DC motor drivers. As shown here, we selected some modern sensorless BLDC motor drivers from the TI catalog to make the first such beret shield. Here it is mounted on a Raspberry Beret, and here it is stacked. Note that when making such shields stackable, we identify which shield is which electronically by using a couple of backside solder jumpers configured differently in each of the shields used, so we can actually stack up to four of these shields without getting their communication signals crossed. Here's a shield with additional brushed DC motor drivers, again with a couple of backside solder jumpers to make them stackable. Here's a shield with a little 0.96 inch OLED display and a couple of buttons, which fits quite compactly into the expansion quadrant providing an effective mechanism for displaying quite a bit of useful information at runtime. Note that several other prefabricated beret shield ideas are currently under active development. The third important class of beret shields is custom, a category which includes all of the beret shields designed by you, the growing beret community. To get started, you can modify directly the open hardware circuit designs of the several prefabricated beret shields that we provide at the community supported GitHub repository, and then tweak them to your own precise needs. Hopefully, you'll be willing to share at least some of your shield designs back with the Beret community by providing links back to your own public GitHub repository to assist others by contributing your own hardware designs. The ability to quickly design and inexpensively manufacture custom Beret shields is a game changer as it facilitates the dense and secure arrangement of your choice of components into a robotic system for long-term use. 
a solution that is much better than implementing fragile little white breadboards into prototype robotic systems. We're also working with a couple of other expansion board layouts in the Beret ecosystem, including high current brushless DC motor driver boards, the size of a Raspberry Pi, and smaller shims for breaking out the functionality of a motherboard header. Just a few remaining random points worth noting. There's Manchester encoding for IR communication available on a pen. There's a place for fixing a rechargeable coin cell on the back. The CAN and RS-45 transceivers can optionally be terminated on the back. There's a spot where an additional six millimeter by eight millimeter QSBI flash memory IC can be soldered on with capacity up to 512 megabytes. This IC has just eight pins, so you can actually solder this on yourself pretty easily if you need it. There are backside solder jumpers built right around the pins of several connectors, which provide a compact way to enable the option of powering that connector with either 3.3 volts or 5 volts as needed. And there is limited ESD protection on some inputs as specified here. Of course, this protection is not provided everywhere, so please do be careful. You can indeed fry this board if the events of the day conspire against you. With that, I wanted to offer a heartfelt thank you in advance. It is primarily going to be by the support of the already growing Bray community hopefully to include you, that such community-supported open hardware designs and the community-supported open source software driving the Bray ecosystem is going to grow and flourish and realize its full potential in both the education and the product development settings. We look forward to being an active participant in this broader open design effort. With your help, we'll also be working up some hat designs soon. I mean, the kind that you wear in your head and provide them essentially at cost to recognize and advocate your essential and valuable involvement in this unique open source effort. The data sheet for the Beret family of boards and other related boards in the growing Beret ecosystem is being developed as chapter five of a new book that we are writing called Renaissance Robotics. You can pick up that data sheet and find a ton of other useful information at robotics.ucsd.edu slash RR.